So we also see a scene in heaven where the Ancient of Days, right, Yahuwah, strips the beasts of their dominion and gives Yeshua everlasting dominion where everyone serves him. Also, this is another example of the challenge with presenting an overlapping timeline because some of the verses that appear together occur with a time gap that are filled in with other verses. So here's what I'm referring to. Um, The example is Revelation chapter 19, verses 20 through 21. We see the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, right? That's the first thing we see. We see more details about this in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. The thrones were cast down, books were open, and judgment was set. So it appears that Revelation is basically summarizing the end of the battle and what will happen to the beast and the false prophet. They basically end up being cast into the lake of fire. When we go backwards into the book of Daniel, we see the casting into the lake of fire occurs after the books are open and they are judged. Then we see the beast, which are kings, are not killed but spared, but their kingdoms are stripped from them and given to Yahshua. Therefore, it appears that the beast and the false prophet, after losing their battle, were taken and held for a short period of time until there was a transition of power. In the video where I did the 30-minute summary of the end-time order of events, I was telling you that I wasn't certain what it was or if it was a ceremony. There's some things I'm going to add to that in just a moment. But nonetheless, uh, like I stated, it appears that the beast and the false prophet, right after losing the battle, they were taken and held for a short period of time until the transition of power. In other words, they were prisoners of war. Notice that Revelation 19.20 says the beast was taken with him, the false prophet. They were taken. The next verse says they were cast alive into the lake of fire. But see, in between these two verses, there's a time gap. In between these two verses, there's a time gap. In between these two verses, there's a time gap. There is a time gap from the time they were taken to the time they were cast into the lake of fire. Some of the time gap is filled in by Daniel chapter 7. There we see the books were opened and they were judged. Something else to address is the other half of Revelation 19.21. Again, found on page 43 of this document. Um, The remnant was slain and eaten by birds. This is clearly on the battlefield. The previous verse that addressed the beast and the false prophet provides a time frame to let us know it was dealing with the battle when they tried to go up against Yeshua but lost. So that's a marker. We know the beast and the false prophet will be judged and cast into the lake of fire, but the remnant were killed. It didn't say the kings were killed. It said the remnant. We know in Daniel, the other beast, which again, beasts are kings, were not killed, but instead their lives were spared and they were stripped of their dominion. It appears that These are the kings that gave their kingdom to the beast. They are the other kings and their lives were spared. Not sure how they got their dominion back, but we know we can identify them because they're the other kings. So who was the remnant that were eaten by birds on the battlefield when the beast and the false prophet were taken? Well, the answer is going to be in a question. The question is, What king goes to battle without an army? The remnant was his military force that backed him. When Yeshua was traveling around, making his visitations and gathering for battle and slaying the nations, we see he also called birds to feast on the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, horses, and basically all men, both free and bond. Remember, these people were wicked, so that's why that's happening. Then... 
he gets around to Mystery Babylon for the final face-off, right? For the showdown. Why would we expect anything different? He slays the people who fought against him and feeds them to the birds. But the beast, the false prophet, and it appears the other kings are held captive until the thrones were cast down, as stated in Daniel, right? Daniel tells us the beast was cast into the burning flame, which is the lake of fire. Now, you might have noticed that it does not mention the false prophet, but we know the false prophet was also cast into the lake of fire because Revelation 19.20 tells us he was taken with the beast. We can confirm both were cast into the lake of fire by reading Revelation 20 verse 10. And the devil that deceiveth them were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. After the thousand years when Satan is defeated, he will be judged and cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. We know the beast and the false prophet were taken and held prisoner until the thrones were cast down. And the other kings were able to live and see their kingdom was given to Yeshua. All right, so now we're going to move to pages 45 through 47. So now how does it transition from being the transference of dominion and power in heaven to going back on earth and watching the nations, right? Bring the Israelites back to Yahuwah's holy mountain. The transition is marked by Daniel chapter 7. And I recommend reading the entire chapter. But what you'll notice is prophecy of the four beasts. And the fourth beast represents the very last kingdom to come to power, which is Mystery Babylon with the ten kings. It's under this kingdom that the king will speak blasphemy against the Most High and will wear out the saints. It's the last kingdom to receive its visitation from Yeshua, who has been traveling to various nations and stomping them out. The last kingdom prevails against the saints until two things happen. So this last kingdom, which is Mystery Babylon, prevails against the saints until two things happen. One, the Ancient of Days comes and judgment is given to the saints of the Most High. So, so far we've seen Yeshua come and visit the nations, saving Mystery Babylon for last. After visiting Mystery Babylon, the beast and the false prophet were taken and held as prisoners of war. And so were the kings of the Mystery Babylon kingdom. While everyone else who joined in battle against Yeshua, a remnant, were killed and fed to the birds. As we follow the trail of breadcrumbs sprinkled throughout scripture, we then can see the scenes shift to the heavens. The scene initially confused me, but the more I spent examining this, the more I understood something. Perhaps it's more than a ceremonial event. This appears to be a court gathering, a hearing at the highest court. We see a sentencing of the beast and the false prophet. Then we see the kings of the earth legally stripped of their dominion, and it is given to Yeshua. We know the kings are not sentenced to death, but instead are given prison sentence of servitude to Israelites. Now, it might still be ceremonial, but it's also clearly a legal transaction that is taking place. A legal transition of power from the kings of the earth to Yeshua. The beast and the false prophet um, are judged and then cast into the lake of fire. So it appears nobody enters into that lake of fire until the books are open and they're judged. That's why the, um, what is it, the second resurrection, which is the second death, um, People are judged, books are open, and those people are also cast into the lake of fire. So the lake of fire is the final sentencing and judgment, and before they enter into the lake of fire, they must be judged for their deeds. And the first two to be judged and cast into the lake of fire are the beast and the false prophet. The other kings, um, like I mentioned, are not sentenced to death, but slavery. Pretty much like the prison system today, right? So we know they went into slavery because of what happens to those who survived 
but were on the wrong side of Hamashiach. But as mentioned previously, the other kings lived, but were stripped of their dominion. Their dominion was given to Yeshua. And perhaps maybe those are the kings that um, they were probably brought back to earth and had to go and get the children of Israel and bring them back. I don't know. And um, this is where we see a transition, right? Yeshua receiving dominion means the saints also possess the kingdom forever. And this is what we are being clued into in Daniel chapter 7, verse 18, 22, 26, and 27. After the fourth beast, kingdom is brought down, dominion is given. So in other words, it's time to possess the kingdom. Um, so the verses that I named, I'm just going to go ahead and read those for you. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That was Daniel 7, 18. Then Daniel 7, 22 says, Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. And lastly, Daniel 7, 26 through 27, But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Once Yeshua receives his dominion, then the focus shifts from the heavens to the holy mountain. We see the nations bringing some of the Israelites to Yeshua's holy mountain. I'm still a little unclear on the whole logistics of it all, but what scripture does tell us is that the surviving Gentiles are bringing the Israelites they had in their possession back to the land. Now, I'm not going to explain or expound more on this video because I actually have future videos that will give a clear understanding of why this is happening, why they're bringing them back the way they are. Um, but I just want you to remember, mark this, hold on to this, because there are some follow-up videos that will give a breakdown and explanation as to why this is happening. So please take a close look at this and make note of it, of how they're being brought back into the land. There is a reason for this. All right, so we're going to continue on pages 47 through 52, and pretty much the self-explanatory. The nations of Israel will be restored back into their place. They will receive wealth. Their language will be restored. They'll receive praise and fame. The people who said that they were the Yahudim or the fake Jews, um, but weren't, those people are going to be humbled. Um, Israel will inherit the desolate lands. Um, here's something that I have to highlight and correct. When I initially addressed this topic about them inheriting the desolate lands, I said, so with the understanding, they will be inheriting the lands that were being made desolate by Yeshua because the people were wicked. And technically, when Israel inherits the kingdom, they will inherit everything, the whole earth. But the verses that were listed where Israel inherits the desolate heritages was actually referring to the land of Israel, not the surrounding nations that were made desolate. Therefore, their territory um, may not be larger um, as I understood because they were merely regaining the land back or basically they're just getting Israel back. So not beyond Israel, just they're re-inheriting their original land. So remember there was a lot of destruction that was going on from the Gentiles and Yeshua who brought judgment, but it appears that these verses are referring to the land of Israel that was made desolate, not the surrounding nations that Yeshua demolished. Because in fact, some of them, to my understanding, were not even supposed to be inhabited again. And this is affirmed in Ezekiel 47 through 48 because they're going to start giving out the land and things like that. Um, so you can check that out. I just wanted to correct myself on that. So as I was stating, they will receive wealth. Their language will be restored. They'll receive praise and fame. The people 
who said that they were the Jews, but were not, but were really the synagogue of Satan, um, they will be humbled. Israel will inhabit the desolate lands. Israel will have servants. The 12 tribes will rule the nations. Um, the Feast of Tabernacles will be restored along with everything under the law. And I actually have a video that explains what will be restored. If you want to view it, it'll be included in the link in the description box. The name of the video is Daniel 9, Part 8b, Offerings, Sacrifices, and the Law, Oh My. Also, a correction which I address in a separate video is that King David, who will be king over Israel, is actually talking about Yeshua, not King David. But knowing that King David is symbolic of Yeshua does not change the message of the video. Lastly, what you have is the span of time changes. Righteous people are living longer and the wicked are, of course, dying sooner.